the committee will uh, reconvene and some uh, return to order. Uh, the chair recognizes themselves for five minutes for the purposes of questioning the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, I was interested in your testimony. And in your testimony, you uh, highlighted the importance of providing FCC with rulemaking authority to flesh out certain requirements of the Best Practices Act and to adapt the bill's provisions to changes in technology. Other stakeholders have raised concern that providing FCC with this type of rulemaking authority in the bill will create enormous regulatory uncertainty that is bad for commerce. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? If the FCC is not provided with rulemaking authority, authority, will the bill quickly become outdated? Are you concerned about regulatory uncertainty? Uh, and um, would you answer those questions for me, please? We think the Best Practices Act does an excellent job of not just providing rulemaking authority to the FTC, but guiding that rulemaking authority by certain criteria that should have to shape the regulations that would emanate from the FTC. Uh, our perspective when we look at privacy legislation is to allow privacy to continue to actually aid innovation instead of impede innovation. Individual pieces of legislation need to be techno uh, technologically neutral to allow for the enforcement agencies to apply those principles to the individual new business models when they come up and to provide guidance in that way. The FTC has been an absolute leader in doing that for the past decade. Uh, Mr. Vladek mentioned the very, uh, various methods that they have used to do that with the different enforcement actions that they've taken plus the roundtables that they've hold and how they've communicated with industry and academics. We think that the Best Practices Act balances those different interests very well. Uh, Ms. Harris, is the approach to FCC rulemaking in, the, in this act good for consumers and uh, is it good for business also? Uh, we think so. Uh, you're always, when, when you're writing a, a bill like this, you can be highly specific and the bill will lock in today's business practices, it will not have the flexibility that you need for business practices that we haven't seen, and it will not allow the law to uh, basically live in a way that, that will address business practices we haven't seen. Giving the FTC very specific rulemaking authority here, first of all, allows them to take into account the different kinds of business models and technologies that we're dealing with, but it also, I think, allows over time for modifications depending on changed circumstances. So yes, we think FTC rulemaking is essential here. Uh, in past legislation, a third party or an unaffiliated party has been defined based on the corporate structure of an entity, such as common ownership or corporate control. And during this hearing and, and other sidebar conversations, uh, we've heard that concerns that consumers may not understand which entities are subsidiaries, uh, affiliates, parent corporations, or otherwise under common control with another company. On the other hand, corporate structure is known, and we do not know, we don't want to draw an arbitrary uh, line. <coughs> uh, Ms. Harris and Mr. Uh, Brzezinski, do you believe that consumers may have difficulty understanding when entities are related by common ownership or control? <coughs> should privacy matter? So should privacy le legislation take into account the best reasonable expectation of a consumer, of a consumer, uh, as this act does, and is this a workable definition? Uh, lastly, I, you can answer these three questions in, in the manner that you would choose to. Uh, lastly, what are the benefits of an approach based on common ownership or control? Does it provide companies with more clarity? So those are a series of questions. I hope that you can kind of summarize the questions in your answers. I'm, I'm going to let Ed go first. <laughs> oh, um, th thank you, Chairman Rush. And I think uh, uh, I want to commend you on your provision recognizing that the artificial distinction of this corporate common control, uh, consumers don't have any idea that their bank owns 
uh, some hundreds or thousands of other affiliated entities. And the Internet uh, has a number of network companies that are the same way. So going to an activities-based uh, definition rather than a corporate ownership definition, we, we support that. And I, I think it's much closer to consumer expectations that except for the company you're doing business with, pretty much everyone else is a third party. So I generally agree. I do think that um, con that your bill probably gets it as close to right as you can because it's a complicated issue, and I'm, I'm glad that there's some room for FTC um, rulemaking uh, on that provision. You know, the key question here is would a consumer under reasonable circumstances believe that they're dealing with uh, an entity that uh, is under common control, and I really think that that's probably has to do with common branding. I think most of us know that Gap and Banana Republic and Old Navy and a whole set of companies are sort of one. Um, but given given sort of large multinationals that uh, you know own many, many, many different lines of business, we have to keep that very narrow in the interest of the consumer. I, I think you've done that. Uh, the chair's time is. Uh, Concluded. Uh, now the chair recognizes Mr. Winchell for five minutes. Thank all of you for your uh, testimony and uh, trying to balance uh, protecting privacy uh, versus generating revenue for advertising to keep the internet the vibrant marketplace that it is. Uh, I searching the browsing history of a particular person and uh, n can, can some of you, maybe Ms. Harris or Mr. Marwinski, identify for me the privacy concerns with the anonymous monitoring of web browsing history uh, and should that require the same level of consent of using information like social security number, bank account numbers, and so forth, and just give me your perspective on the differences there. And Mr. Whitfield, the, the way that they're, you know, that they're able to collect discrete pieces of browsing history are usually to tie them together with an, with a, uh, an IP address. Um, in that instance, uh, companies can pull them together in, into profiles, and they can be put together with information to identify the consumer. So in the technological environment that we're in now, the ability to bring discrete pieces of information together into an identifiable profile is simply much easier. I, I think there's a conversation to be had about where you draw the line, um, but, but I think that that's something that's changed dramatically from you know, the first time that privacy legislation was introduced in Congress. Mr. Whitfield, I would agree and I would say that uh, uh, from our perspective, one of the strongest pieces of both bills is that IP addresses are insensitive information. We're concerned uh, that de-identified or supposedly anonymous information can be re, uh, repackaged back together. There are numerous examples of that happening. Uh, and I would, um, I, would, I would also point out that uh, a recent complaint by U.S. Perg, the Center for Digital Democracy and other groups talks about just how easy it is and how the technology has changed in the last few years that uh, consumers are being sold on a real-time basis now. They are not compiling dossiers uh, that take even uh, half an hour to compile. Uh, the ads are being served instantly. They're being brokered to the highest bidder. It's a very sophisticated and little bits of information can add up very quickly. Uh, Mr. Zanus, would you like to comment on this? very much appreciate the opportunity uh, I think Congress has to be careful not to try to legislate the possible or the theoretical and to understand the business model and here actually I, I, I disagree slightly with Leslie it, it's not the vast or predominant business model to tie clickstream data back to personally identifiable information certainly not in the online advertising space in fact many uh, of the ad networks specifically Advertising networks deliver some 90% of all ads online. They're generally third party by nature. Their business model generally is not to try to tie it back to what we would traditionally think of as personally identifiable information. Certainly there's a lot that is possible through technology.
But I don't think we can legislate the possible. We ought to be looking at actual business models. And I think when we look at H.R. 5777, it, it actually gets closer under their definition of covered information to what we ought to be focusing on, which is things that actually are personally identifiable, not sort of anonymous in nature. Mm. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein, since you're an academic here, do you have any comments on this? We always value academics' uh, thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. I, I would think I would just add that it's important not to think of anonymous data as just a binary category, that it's data is either anonymous or it's non-anonymous. And the emphasis might be on specific contexts, so how much data is being assembled, what's the quantity of data, um, is it being publicly shared or privately shared, what's the specific context, uh, rather than try to get at this through definitions that, that have just a, a black and white uh, aspect to them. Okay. Yes. I'd just like to add one one point on that. To that, uh, I, I think the current draft of the Best Practices Act actually recognizes that reality that Professor Rubenstein is commenting on. A as uh, an employee of a technology company, there are a number of unique identifiers in hardware and software that are used on most computing platforms. What is happening in reality, m Mr. Zanis' point is a very good one. We need to look at the reality is that it is some of those unique identifiers that are used and to uh, correlate to a, a lot of this data. That could be described sometimes as personally identifiable information. Others might say, no, it's only identifying a particular device or a particular <coughs> device at a point in time. That's why I actually think the definition of preference profile, which is saying that it, it's a list of preferences associated with an individual or with an individual's computer or other device, but then tying that to allow an e exception for participation in a choice program is an excellent way to navigate the issues that even if something is not completely identifiable to a particular individual, it still could have the great potential to impact an individual. Thank you. I see my time's almost up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Mr. Uh, <coughs> I won't need 15, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I, I won't even need five. Uh, but thank you. I, I, don't, I really don't have any questions, um, having come in uh, after the votes and after your testimony. But uh, I do want to express my appreciation to the chairman and to uh, the ranking member for uh, the deliberate process that we have undertaken in um, examining, reviewing, and modifying issues relating to privacy when it comes to access to uh, the internet and broadband generally. Uh, I think uh, having all the stakeholders present and participating in this discussion is very, very important. And we, we see that today. We've seen it in the past and we'll see it in the future, whether it's uh, academia, uh, industry, uh, government officials, consumer advocacy groups, all of those uh, uh, stakeholders deserve a place at the table and uh, our chairman and the ranking member have offered them that. So I want to thank uh, the witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, the ranking member for, uh, again, such a deliberate and uh, thorough analysis of uh, an issue that uh, is becoming increasingly important as we see the role of uh, broadband integrated into virtually all aspects of our lives. And I yield back my time. Mr. Chair, thanks to the gentleman for his kind remarks. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, uh, now uh, entertain a second round of questions. And with that in mind, the chair recognizes himself for, uh, for five minutes. Uh, <coughs> this question is addressed to Mr. Vladek and Mr. Zainis. Uh, Section 303 of the Act states that covered entities using covered information or censored information for any purpose for as long as there is a legitimate business or law enforcement need um, is our uh, rebuttal presumption, is it too vague? What would be wrong with setting a date certain restrictions, say six months or a year? Mike, uh, Mike you want to go first? Uh, <laughs> well, I, the commission is not taking a position on these issues, and we would like the opportunity to to comment uh, later on once we've had a, a fuller uh, opportunity to look at this. Mm -hmm. um, just 
generally, uh, you know, we believe that certain kinds of information ought to be s uh, subject to uh, heightened protection. And so uh, that is, you know, the commission has made that clear uh, in other contexts. We're gonna we're gonna figure this out. Luckily, I represent the advertising industry, so I know how to get my message heard, even when people don't want to hear it. I think Section 303. Uh, we we I think this one size fits all doesn't always make sense in the online space. What you see here is a diversity of opinions, but what we see in the in the industry is a diversity of business models, and sometimes they may need to keep information for different purposes and what is a legitimate business purpose I think differs so you know I want to take that back to my members and see if it's something that they're going to be supportive of or if there's some refinements we need to make but as we've seen around things like consumer notice and other areas a one-size-fits-all isn't always the best approach but we're willing to look at that and work with the the committee and, and you Mr. Chairman on that. Yeah, Mr. Augustine would you uh, chime in on this with your, your opinion please? I would generally agree that having different time periods for different types of data or different purposes is a good idea rather than a single limit. I think the one thing that uh, Congress should worry about though is companies that would retain data simply because they might have some use of it in the future. So where it's that nonspecific and it's just a future business possibility, I don't think that's a sufficient reason for some unlimited period of retention. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Rubenstein and Mr. Uh, Mazwinski uh, suggested in the testimony that the safe harbor in HR 577 be stricken in several ways. I'm going to ask both gentlemen, uh, what specific recommendation do you have for strengthening the safe harbor provision? Uh, thank you, Mr. Rush. I, I think the bill as currently structured captures the key point that I emphasized about having a mix of carrots and sticks and that the private right of action serves as a, a very significant stick or incentive for businesses uh, to join. I think the one thing that I'd call attention to though is whether the uh, Safe Harbor Choice Program has a strong enough emphasis on high performance standards and that's why I emphasized um, data governance practices such as appointing a chief privacy officer or having privacy by design methodologies so that there are other um, standards that a choice participant lives up to which in effect um, entitles them to the exemptions that they enjoy under the choice program. And I think the question then is how to best balance that mix of exemptions on the one hand that serve as incentives to join while ensuring that only companies engaged in a very high level of privacy protection are, are then entitled. Finally, I would point to um, the desirability of having some form of public consultation as part of this process. And one way to do that might be for a choice program as part of their application for approval to indicate what type of public consultation they've engaged in. Have they met with advocacy groups? Have they met with the public? If so, how have they addressed concerns that those groups have raised? If they haven't addressed them, why not? Uh, so that all is transparent and available to the FTC uh, in making its evaluation of the choice program. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chairman, I would, um, I would add to that that uh, I think our concern is that many self-regulatory programs, whether under the Securities and Exchange Commission, whether under the FTC or other agencies, they work best when they have a robust legal standard, robust statutory framework underneath, and uh, relying on the companies themselves uh, and, and rulemaking only by the FTC uh, is usually not good enough. And we would, we would urge you to consider uh, strengthening the Federal Trade Commission's monitoring of the choice program and the accountability mechanisms in there. Uh, and to do that, of course, we'd also support strengthening the Federal Trade Commission in general if they need additional resources uh, to do those kinds of things. Uh, my time is up. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the ranking member. Thank you. Is there anyone on the panel other than Mr. Goldman that believes there should not be a private right of action? 
Okay. Yes, in, in, Intel does not support a, a private right of action. We think that it, in the context of privacy, uh, in the great percentage uh, uh, of situations, the individual actually does not even potentially know that they've been harmed, a and they don't know who actually has caused the harm until after. We think the, uh, the best use of resources is to focus on mechanisms like the choice program in the way that was just articulated that really can devote those resources to organizations putting in place robust accountability mechanisms into their compliance programs. That way we'll avoid the breaches before they even happen. And I, I won't take up much of your time. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I would just say then I think what we might want to focus, focus on legislatively is strengthening the Federal Trade Commission in their enforcement. And uh, more resources, more cops on the beat, I think would be a good thing in this area. I'm certainly not an expert in this area. In fact, I'm far from it. But uh, I've read that the OECD's um, privacy protection rules, guidelines for privacy protection, are some of the most stringent in, in the world. I is that your understanding as well, most of you? Do you understand that to be true? Uh, I, I would just say it's, it's the understanding of privacy groups that they are the most robust implementation of the fair information practices that were actually first developed by a U.S. Uh, regulatory committee. Uh, but, but, but how, they're, uh, how they are uh, implemented in law is different in different places. And I'd say the only U.S. law that comes close to implementing them in a very strong way is something called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which regulates credit bureaus. Other laws rely on a much weaker version of the FIPS. But we, I mean, I if we were to adopt the OECD principles, basically, would you support that? Or? Oh, absolutely. And I, I want to say that both bills adopt parts of it. And in fact, the, the best practices bill adopts quite a bit okay. of the fair information practices. We think we can go further with pur purpose specificity, data minimization, data retention, uh, and again, accountability that is giving more rights to the data subjects. Well, uh, yeah, Ms. Mr. Whitfield, I just I want to agree that a strong set of fair information practices, and certainly the OECD is, is sort of the foundational in the United States, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, issued a set a few years ago that I think are, you know, perhaps uh, capture some of the more modern concerns just a little bit. Uh, that basically a bill really needs to include them all. That we've spent a long time focusing on, you know, opt in, opt out consent from the consumer. And when that's all you have in a bill, then you're pretty much telling the consumer that they've got to figure it out. They've got to read privacy policies, they've got to understand it and that the companies don't have any substantive obligations. When you include data minimization, et cetera, then, then you're putting real limits and, and companies have to decide how to handle those. Mr. Marwinski, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just, just I want to be sure that, that the chairman and, and you, ranking member Whitfield, understand that there is a lot of fair information practices in certainly in H.R. 5777. I, you're talking about notice and choice and data security and accuracy. Uh, these are fair information practice principles. Um, that doesn't mean you need all of them in a bill about things like marketing databases. And in our written testimony, we go into the access and correction provisions. And the reality there is what we're talking about in some of these marketing databases are strings, user agent strings, which are nothing more than computers talking to computers, telling you what, for instance, operating system a computer, a, a person is using to go to a site. This is used to render the content readable to the consumer. I, I ask you, what is the, you know, what is the purpose in allowing correction to that type of database? It's, it's gobbledygook to the consumer. And, and I worry about allowing uh, people to get into those databases when there's no real harm. We're not talking about uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act. There you're talking about adverse actions against consumers, things centered around uh, employment eligibility, access to credit, getting a home mortgage. It's not what we're talking about here. May I ask one other question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I want to strongly disagree with that. Um, access is one of the key fair information principles. Uh, 
the likelihood that a consumer is going to demand access to a string of code, I think, you know, if, if that's the concern, my guess is we can figure out how to handle it in this committee. But um, we're building larger and larger databases with all kinds of information, and uh, it, to me, that's one of the fundamental rights that consumers have, uh, and that it needs to be part of this bill. In, in Mr. Rush's bill, in the definitions under covered entity, it simply says engaged in interstate commerce, whatever, whatever, whatever. And since I was in the railroad industry, I know that when we talk about federal preemption, it's from a business standpoint, we always love federal preemption because we had some certainty in whatever state we operate in and so forth. And I know that a number of you would be opposed to federal preemption in this arena. Uh, are any of you opposed to? Uh, yours? Okay, Mr. Well, I think we're we're very strongly opposed, okay. and the the uh, best practices bill is a much narrower form of preemption. But we'd prefer that federal law be a floor. What about you, Mr. Rubenstein? Do you have a comment on that? Um, I, I would favor a narrow form of preemption. I think that it does um, allow businesses to operate with more uh, certainty, and um, it's extremely uh, difficult and costly and not very effective to have to um, design compliance programs that vary depending on uh, which states you operate in. Um, so I think some form of preemption is, is, a, is a necessary aspect of this yeah. bill. Did you want to make a comment, Ms. Harrell? Uh, yes, Mr. Whitfield. Uh, CDT's position is that uh, first the bill has to be good enough at the federal level to consider preemption. So, you know, in saying whether we support it or don't support it, you know, if this is this is a messy process. Yeah. But assuming that the bill provides the right degree of protection, then a narrow preemption that really covers just the, those covered entities and just those practices is something that that we are comfortable with. Yeah. But you know, there's a threshold of what the bill is, and right. you know, I, I, we do think that that uh, Mr. Rush's bill uh, gets that right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I was assuming that if Mr. Rush pushed the bill through, it would be all right. <laughs> uh, I want to get a one other question, and this question is uh, addressed to Ms. Go Mr. Goldman and Ms. Harris. In your testimony earlier, you say that user IDs, identification alone, should not be uh, defined as covered information. And given the, the fact that there are software passwords, guessing tools out in the marketplace, um, what kind of concerns uh, should we have? And I'm kind of uh, pointing to a recent um, development uh, among uh, and myself uh, and with myself and some other members of Congress, uh, there's a certain company that that has something they call street maps, and I'm really uh, alarmed by these street maps. I, my residence is showing up on on these street maps, and there are other members of Congress whose residence is showing up on these street maps, and and we're we're we're, we're concerned about. Um, the vulnerability, especially for unprotected um, uh, unprotected access to the webs and internet, what 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 kind of harm could be could be um, uh, visited? by consumers with some of these different programs. So can you respond to that, Ms. Harris and Mr. Uh, Goldman, about uh, this particular issue? Um, sure, sure, I'll go. I'll go. I mean, I think as in our testimony, I think we, we talked about how if the information is not directly linked back to the individual, so if it's just a password, or, or some other kind of information that's not, you know, connected to your other kind of personal information, uh, that should now be part of the PII. 
and so I think that I think that is uh, where we're at. I, you, could, you know, you could theoretically you could have a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information out there. You might, for for example, if you belong to a social you know a social networking site, you might put your name up there. You might create a username, you know, but it might not be linked back to your own name or your own personal, I guess, you know, whether it's financial or or health or health information. Um, so I think you know as long as that you know the question is what kind of harm is going to result from all of that. I think. And, and, as, and as also we go into our as we go into our testimony, also talks about how you know, we're 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 hesitant about adopting sort of new standards and new definitions of cover information. Um, I think you know the extent that we can standardize definitions across you know across bills, across state bills and federal bills, um, that would be a good thing. So if you look at personal information as defined in some of the state bills, some of the state data breach and privacy bills, um, I think you know I, we haven't taken. Uh, I think there'll be some support for that, but I haven't d talked to our members about that at all yet. Is there any uh, response? If the if the question is about you know whether we should be covering passwords and unique identifiers that protect this kind of information, then I think in the right circumstances we should, and I think that your your bill um, does do that. Does any other witness want to respond, Mr. Hoffman? You need. Yeah, I, I think it's a very good question. I, I think we find ourselves in a situation where there are a number of different kinds of data that while they do not point to a very specific individual, they might pr um, point to a device or a, a location or something that could end up impacting that individual. This is a very difficult balance to sort out. I, I, I actually think the best practice is that comes very close to getting this as right as you possibly can. We're saying if you've got those kinds of identifiers, whether it's a password, a user, a alias, an IP address or something, that it will be covered if it, if it falls under two uh, different categories. One would be if it relates to a specific individual or then if whether it's created to maintain a preference profile. That may not cover every way that this information could potentially impact an individual at some time, but I think that would give business enough certainty to understand what's being covered and would cover the great bulk of the situations where people are concerned right now. I, I think the definition, in some, we're sort of in some ways putting the cart before the horse. The, the choice options that we identify really also matter because when you put a blanket opt-in for third-party data usage, which is the Internet, we did a survey earlier this year that demonstrated that over 80 percent of all online advertising campaigns used behavioral targeting or techniques. So when you're talking about opt-in for third-party data usage, you're talking about the vast majority of the economic engine of the Internet. So it really matters what choice mechanism you give because the stakes really get high. Now, in our self-regulatory system that we, that we put out, we actually followed very closely the, the FTC zone definition, which was extremely broad and included you know, sort of all data used for beha behavioral advertising, online behavioral advertising. But because we had an opt-out requirement instead of an opt-in, it was something that our industry, at least, I can speak for us, we could live with that. We could live with a broader definition if we got the choice mechanism right. So I think they all kind of, th you know, this is a holistic bill, and the different provisions really have to work together. You've, you've had great staff work to put this together, and we just need to be cognizant of that, and we stand ready to work through those issues with you. Uh, do we have any additional questions? I'll just make one other comment. Uh, we, we hear a little bit of debate about adopting a fully opt-in system, and the we've heard some people say whether it would significantly impact e-commerce in a negative way. Uh, how many of you feel that it would? An opt-in system would dramatically impact e-commerce. Okay. So every, almost everybody up there, except I guess you, Mr. Mowinski, and <laughs> there's some ambiguity <laughs> here. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Well, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that you know we've been struggling with this question for a long time, and uh, and, and I'm not speaking for the commission now. Uh, I'm speaking for staff. Um, I think there's too much freight given to the question of the label of opt-in or opt-out. The concepts are not self-defining. 
And skilled marketers, and there are lots of them out there, can easily make either method of expressing choice either easy or difficult. We've both given what is called affirmative consent because we've clicked a button, and we've both, you know, all of us have, have uh, easily given in to either method. In our view, the question really doesn't boil down to this label. It's a legal label. It's not really a practical label. We believe that the goal ought to be to ensure that consumers are well informed and are given easy, easy and clear tools with which to exercise choice. Clarity and ease of use ought to be the key metrics, not easily manipulable legal terms like opt-in and opt-out. Okay. And that's, that's where we think the real problem is. Thank you. Thank you. Do you agree? I have nothing to add to okay. what Mr. Uh, he, we should have asked him a question earlier. <laughs> uh, I'm fine. <laughs> well, the, the chair, uh, that concludes our questioning. Uh, and <coughs> I, again, want to reiterate to the witnesses how appreciative we are for you taking uh, your time to come and share with us uh, your expertise and your uh, insights into this process, into both the draft, uh, Mr. Bowser's draft bill, and to uh, HR. 5777. Uh, and the chair wants to assure everyone who's present and uh, including our witnesses that there will be ample opportunity for more input uh, before we uh, mark up this, this bill. Uh, I am uh <coughs> uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that this bill was introduced four days ago and we're having a hearing. But I'm also determined that we need to uh, move forward. You know, uh, I'm not sure. You know, there won't be too, there'll be a lot of deliberation, but uh, won't be unnecessary delay in terms of getting this bill uh, to the full committee um, and hopefully to the floor. Uh, and we want to work with some. Uh, with I want to give you assurances that your time is just not being wasted here. It's really uh, your uh, <coughs> in investment in this process uh, will result in a better bill, but it will be a bill that hopefully will become law. And I want to thank you so very much for being here this afternoon. And with that said, uh, the subcommittee is now adjourned.